Hi, everybody. My name is Yisrael Mirsky. I'm a cybersecurity researcher at Ben Gurion University. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the world of deepfakes for medical imagery, specifically 3D medical imagery. So a little background. So as some of you may not know, uh, MRI and CT machines produce 3D volumetric images of the human body. And they're used for diagnosing a wide variety of medical issues. And uh, in uh, the 2016, there were about 100 million of these scans performed in the US alone. So what's the vulnerability? Well, if you do a quick search on census.io, you'll find something like 10,000 of these networks exposed to the internet. And as we know that uh, the healthcare industry has a quite a poor security track record, uh, and if just an example of that is that a several months ago, McAfee researchers were able to uh, infiltrate one of these networks and download a CT scan of somebody's pelvis and then print out a 3D model. And the reason that that happens is that there's a, a really big lack of internal uh, network security on the healthcare side. Uh, and for example, you have old software, you have non-existent or improper encryption, exposed infrastructure, and so on. So the threat is that what if an attacker doesn't just download your data, what if he actually manipulates your data, and what if he's able to uh, cause some sort of uh, in, in, uh, uh, effect to your imagery to cause a uh, misdiagnosis? So our research goal is to expose, validate, and help mitigate this threat. But why would an attacker want to do this? Well, there's a few different aspects. First is, is the psychological aspect. Perhaps the attacker is trying to uh, cause a political leader to stand down, to rethink his life. Uh, there's the monetary aspect. Think of insurance fraud. If somebody puts in a small aneurysm into his uh, own scan, he can then try and claim uh, quality of life insurance, which is very hard to refute this kind of evidence. And there's the physical aspect. The attacker is very malicious, and he wants to cause physical harm, for example, in an act of terrorism. So uh, what's the general attack model? So if we look at a, a, a standard hospital, what will happen is that when the patient gets a scan, the machine produces a bunch of 2D slices of the body and sends it over the network in what's referred to as DICOM format to a server called the PAX server. Then later, the radiologist will pull these scans, write up a report, and forward that to the referring doctor. So our, uh, our, the, the initial attack vectors really were at the point where the data is transferred over the network towards the PAX server, where if the attacker is able to manipulate the contents there, then he can possibly affect the diagnosis. So what are some of the challenges of the attacker? First of all, there's realism. So the injected or removed condition has to respect the surrounding anatomy. It can't just be copy-pasted into the image. And it must be convincing from every single angle. It can't just be that we're editing the 2D slices because the radiologist will look at it from every possible angle. And then there's the aspect of complexity. So state-of-the-art GANs can handle something about 1 million pixels, whereas CT scans and MRI scans have upwards of 600 million voxels. And automation. So many radiology networks are actually air-gapped. And the diagnosis can actually happen right after the scan is taken, so there's very little time to tamper, so you can't perform Photoshopping. And the attack uh, may need to be actually real time, for example, inside the radiologist's viewer itself. So uh, in order to show that this attack is possible, we developed this framework called CTGAN. And we focused on one particular use case, which is lung cancer. So uh, to, before we start, we have to get a data set. So this is how we prepared our data set. So we got some free scans off the internet. There's so many different databases of CT scans. Uh, we use this one called LIDC. And once we had our data set of scans, we used the annotations to extract uh, cubes of the areas wherever there was cancer. And we pre-processed those cubes by performing histogram uh, equalization and some normalization. And then we got something about a very small data set of 600 samples. And because that's way too small to perform any deep learning, we then did some augmentation. So we did some rotations and some shifts of all the samples, and we got something like 16,000 samples in total. So with this data set, what model did we use? We used the uh, custom 3D pix to pix uh, network for in-painting. And that works something like this. So you have a generator. And uh, you take a sample, and you zero out the center, kind of mask the center with zeros. and you have the generator try and recreate the center of that, uh, of that sample with cancer. So this would work uh, as is as a convolutional neural network. However, you get, tend to get some blurry images. So uh, what we do actually is we add in this discriminator. 
And the discriminator is trying to police the outputs of the generator to make, trying to make sure that those results look as realistic as possible. And the discriminator gets both the, uh, either a sample that is real or fake and the context, the surrounding tissue, i.e. the masked sample. So we train this framework altogether once to, for on cancer samples only, so, that's on, so the generator network only knows how to complete samples with cancer. And then once again, we repeat the entire process with healthy samples so that we get another generator that can then try and remove cancer. So how does the entire process work? So when the malware sees a DICOM file going over the network, it checks the meta tags, determine if it's the right target, and then ex uh, uses a very uh, basic uh, localization algorithm. There's many different alg uh, algorithms out there for finding uh, uh, candidate locations. So it finds a candidate location for injection or removal, depending on what the goal is. Performs all the pre-processing steps, interpolation, equalization, normalization, masks the center, uses the appropriate generator if it's trying to inject or remove, and then reverses the entire process. And at the very end, we add some uh, additional noise, some Gaussian noise, to try and cover up uh, the interpolation blur, so the radiologist won't uh, see this kind of blurry uh, mark inside the scan. And we paste it back inside the scan. So here are some sample of results. So here's for cancer injection. So you can see uh, that on the uh, right side is the after tampering, and we're just looking at 2D slices around those uh, cubes. And this is for removal, and you can see it does a, quite a good job. And this is a 3D view, because again, we're working with 3D samples. So uh, for our evaluation, uh, we had to make sure that the results looked accurate, that uh, it would fool a radiologist. So what we did is we took 100 samples, uh, and we split it up as follows in the image tampering step. First, we took 35 samples, which are actual, or scans, I should say, that were actually cancers, had cancers in the lungs. And we used our algorithm to auto automatically remove all the cancer it could find. And then we took an additional uh, 35 scans, uh, which were healthy, and we added one or more uh, cancerous nodules to those uh, scans. And then we took the remaining 30 scans as a baseline. For our evaluation, we used three expert radiologists, and we used a, a state-of-the-art uh, lung cancer screening AI with the same model that won the Kaggle uh, 2017 bowl. For our evaluation, we had two trials. First, a blind trial where we, didn't, we told the radiologist nothing about the tampering. We just asked them to diagnose the scans. And then we had an open trial where we told the radiologist the truth about the scans, and we asked them what do they think, which ones do they think have been tampered, which ones do they think are original. So for the blind test, we found that uh, for injection, there was about a 99 uh, percent attack success rate, and for removing cancer, 94 percent attack success rate. And for the AI, it failed every single time. Whenever we added cancer, remove cancer, it thought that this was a legitimate image and did not think that there were, uh, did not miss a sample in any case. And when we asked the uh, radiologists what they think about those fake samples, again, in the blind trial, they believed that mo for most of the fake samples, that they were actually malign, meaning that they require some sort of uh, biopsy or treatment follow to follow up uh, given these findings. Then for the open test, when we reviewed, uh, re uh, revealed the truth to the radiologists, uh, there was, they were very inconsistent in terms of their predictions, meaning that uh, about somewhere between 20% accuracy and 60% accuracy for injecting and removing samples, and they weren't able to really differentiate what is a real cancer sample was a, a fake cancer sample. So it's not enough to uh, say that, okay, uh, attacker has some scans and you can tamper them realistically, fine. But we also have to show that this is in indeed a threat, that an attacker can get his hands on these scans in order to uh, manipulate them. So in order to prove this, we performed a covert penetration test on an active hospital. So this is a, a quick uh, topo topological view of a hospital. I'm going to be very brief. You can take a look at our paper for all the different uh, details on the, on the attack surface of a hospital. Uh, but you basically look something like this. You have a bunch of different scanning modalities, and they're connected to these uh, workstations, which are often not uh, X Windows XP machines. And uh, they send the, their scans in DICOM format over their internal network to a PACS database. 
And in the same network, you have radiologist workstations and various other systems. And the PACS network, this radiology network, is often also connected to the hospital's network, which is connected to Wi-Fi networks. And uh, both these networks are often also connected to the internet for remote access and uh, emails and so on. So you can, as you can see quite clearly, there's lots of attack vectors from the internet, from uh, local uh, uh, Wi-Fi access points, and of course, uh, physical intrusion as well. And uh, we tried to demonstrate the physical side uh, to show how this attack can be accomplished. So to do that, we took a Raspberry Pi and a USB to Ethernet adapter, and we printed out a, a Philips label to make it look inconspicuous. And uh, we put on side this Raspberry Pi, we just simply set it up as a transparent network bridge with our malware to intercept any DICOM scans that we should see. So uh, then I went to the hospital, of course, with permission, but without letting them know that I was coming. And uh, I went in at night so when the cleaning staff opened the doors and I walked right in. The cleaning staff didn't ask anything, they didn't say anything, or walked right past them like I belonged there. And it only took a few minutes to find the radiology's uh, workstations. And after that, only about another few minutes to find uh, at least one of their CT scanners. And uh, once I found their CT scanner, it took something like um, about uh, 30 seconds to install the man in the middle device. And because the man in the middle device has, you know, is a Raspberry Pi, I also have an access point now. So I was able to go to the, uh, uh, the waiting room and then get a complete backdoor into the system. So something else I should point out is that uh, not only were, uh, after, after I planted this, uh, this uh, man in the middle device, I, was, uh, I then you know, revealed it to the hospital and they let me take a few scans to see what I could see. Um, I found that these scans were actually being sent over the hospital network in plain text. And at, through the help of Kim Zetter, a journalist, I was able to find out that this is actually the case for most hosp many hospitals in the United States and around the world, that the internal network is considered safe, so they don't enable encryption. But it's not just because it's con considered safe, but also because of all uh, types of legacy constraints and things like that. So this is showing, uh, capturing a scan going over the network. And even though it says uh, it's being encrypted with SSLs, it's all in plain text, uh, because otherwise their other systems wouldn't be able to read it. And then I was able to run the malware and intercept and manipulate the scans. So what are some countermeasures? So uh, for prevention, uh, we could just simply secure the data in motion. We can just simply enable proper encryption over the network, and we can at least mitigate this man-in-the-middle attack. But uh, as I mentioned before, many hospitals uh, don't encrypt their internal traffic for uh, compatibility issues. And also, we can try and uh, you know, bring up staff awareness, let them know that you know, don't let, if you see somebody you don't recognize, maybe ask him what he's doing there and not let him walk right in. And for detection, uh, we can enable digital signatures. So in the DICOM format, so there's actually part of the standard is digital signatures. So scanners can actually place uh, a signature on the scans, and those can be verified. But as far as I know, nowhere in industry they're actually being using this at the, in the hospitals themselves. And uh, for more advanced methods, we can perform watermarking and uh, temp uh, image tamper detection algorithms. Uh, however, for watermarking, it's not being used in industry mostly because it affects the quality of the image, and that's, of course, you don't want to affect medical images in any way. And uh, for uh, tamper detection, we found that at least these, al these algorithms don't work out of the box, probably because of the way the scans are being generated with this radial kind of properties. So the noise is different, so these uh, algorithms need to be adjusted in order to work on CT scans and MRI scans. So in conclusion, uh, attackers can inject uh, medical evidence into CT and MRI scans. They can do it automatically and realistically, and uh, the attack succeeds 100% uh, of the time against uh, state-of-the-art AI, and about be between 96 and 99% of the time uh, for expert radiologists. We also showed how the attack is viable and how it can be mitigated. And for future work, uh, we're also we're looking at how to uh, adapt classical image tampering localization algorithms for radiology imagery. And we're also uh, looking, how to, uh, looking at how we can use CTGAN to help uh, train radiologists for completely benign reasons to help. Since uh, many of these data sets have privacy concerns, uh, we're, uh, using CTGAN we can actually generate potentially infinite data sets for radiologists to learn from. So if anybody wants to try, uh, check out the code in our data sets, feel free to uh, take a look at our GitHub page. Uh, and uh, how much time do we have left? Because I, I have a short demo I can show. Two minutes? 
So uh, I'll quickly try and load up a, a demo. And if some, anybody has questions, please feel free to come up and ask. So, oh. Yes. So in the US, tampering with medical uh, data like this that might result in death or someone is actually a felony and you can go to jail for a long time. Isn't it easier to just secure physically the device, uh, the room in which, say, the MRI or a CT scan is, rather than doing all this complicated um, stuff on the wire that's going to break uh, usability? Yeah, so absolutely. And uh, well, first of all, uh, that's, they should definitely be enforcing the physical security. But uh, even if you enforce physical security, you know, uh, you, malware can get there. You know, it's not just because it's, you know, somewhat segregated. As we saw, there's many, they're connected to the internet many times. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get some malware in there. And also, uh, in some, uh, I, I know in some countries at least, uh, these scans are actually given to the patient themselves to so then bring it to the referring doctor. So once they have it in their hands, they can do whatever they want with them. So this is just showing, for example, for injecting, you can click on random areas. It'll take a few seconds to load them all for the first time. And then for removal, just very quickly. Does anybody have any other questions? There's a good example here. Yeah, so this is showing you removal as well. Yeah, any, yes. Okay, so Ahmed Salam from CISPA. Thanks for your talk and really nice results. I'm just curious, so why do you need to generate these images? Why don't just use some real images with like cancer or without cancer? Why do you need to regenerate them? So you're asking like basically why not just Photoshop it, just copy paste into the image? Exactly. Ah, so because many times because the, the body has to match up, right? Because people have different BMIs, uh, you have to discern uh, mass and scales, and the uh, radiologist doesn't just get image and make a decision. She gets all sorts of other you know uh, information about the patient, and also the referring doctor gets the scan afterwards, and he he sits in front of the patient. So if it doesn't makes sense, you know, the, the, the size and the scale of the, of the, of the individual, mm -hmm. then there's going to be a lot of questions raised. Thanks. Very nice work. I thought an interesting result was that the moment you told the doctors that there is some susceptibility of, of things being fake, they became, at least based on the slide, very unreliable. So it seems to me that that itself can be an attack vector. Yes. Yes, I mean, the main, the main concern there was once after we're telling, telling them the truth is that we also tell them we're removing cancer. So yes. there it's very hard because they have to kind of like maybe look for some artifacts, some noise yeah. in order to determine and there you can have a lot of false positives. I also had a question. Did, did you um, find that some architectures were more efficient at uh, like in terms of the generative model that you're using? How did you like? Yeah, so we tried a few different to... methods. Uh, the first one actually we went to was CycleGAN, uh, so because it seemed the most natural choice, which CycleGAN basically gave it a whole set of, let's say, cancer, uh, cancerous images and uh, healthy images, and it learns how to automatically transfer from one domain to the other. Whereas here we have to train two separate models on two separate data sets. But we found it didn't work out so well, and I believe the reason was simply because uh, the amount, number of data points we had. We only had 600 positive samples, which is really, really small. Uh, so once you try to run CycleGAN, you need a much bigger data set. Any other questions? All right. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.